Welcome, folks. Still a few attendees trickling in from the waiting room. We're going to wait just a moment before we begin. Excellent. I think it's starting to even off. So I'll start off with some housekeeping notes for you all. I'm Marshall Bradshaw, part of the LVN staff, and thank you for coming by for The Subtle Art of Storytelling, How Matter Reporting Creates Better Business Outcomes. I have a little bit of housekeeping here, just some simple things. First off, at any point, you can post questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. That way, all the presenters will be able to see your questions and either answer them during the presentation or answer them towards the end. Uh, don't put your questions, however, in the chat box. The chat box is a great place for you to go and say hi. Uh, also, you can use that to reach me if you have any technical issues, but post questions in the Q&A box. This event is being recorded. However, you audience members don't have to worry about your webcams or microphones. Those won't activate. So no need for, to uh, worry about revealing your midday pajamas to anyone. Uh, and finally, if you're joining us as a non-member, thank you for coming. Lovely to have you. If you like what you see today, swing by LegalValueNetwork.com and think about becoming a member. We'd love to have you join for a few more of these. Uh, with that, joining me today to introduce the webinar topic and our group of panelists is Levi Remley, Director of Pricing at Barnes & Thornburg and a member of the Legal Value Network's Education Committee. Levi? Thank you, Marshall. With that, let's get to our program titled The Subtle Art of Storytelling, How Matter Reporting Creates Better Business Outcomes. Matter reporting can be an exceptionally powerful tool, as we all know, especially to enhance relationships, especially when a report can effectively tell a compelling story and not simply provide data. Clients and law firms alike agree that per a report created by the Blickstein Group and the Legal Value Network, communication could almost always be improved and matter reporting offers both parties ongoing touch points to enhance relationships and business outcomes. How can legal departments, law firms, and business partners collaborate to take their matter reporting efforts to the next level and tell a story? Here to guide this conversation is our esteemed moderator, Casey Flaherty, co-founder and chief strategy officer at LexFusion. Casey, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Joining Casey as our panelists are Bob Taylor, Managing Director at Deloitte Legal Business Services, Matt Walquist, Managing Director of Strategic Pricing and Client Value at Fagri Drinker, and my colleague, Elizabeth Schroeder, Senior Manager of Legal Project Management at Barnes & Thornburg. Each of these individuals offers a unique perspective with professional experiences at various law firms, legal departments, and consulting companies. I'm confident they'll provide some meaningful insights on this topic. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Casey to guide us through a conversation about storytelling rather than uh, through, through matter reporting. Casey, the floor is all yours. Great, and can you confirm that you can see my screen? I can. So yeah, uh, uh, four, four smiling faces. So everyone, uh, thank, you, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I guess we have to start with a story about st stories. Um, stories make the world uh, because stories are, are how we think. Uh, human beings think in terms of narrative, uh, even when one does not exist. Uh, we, have, we have a way of trying to weave coherence into random facts and figures uh, that we encounter. And so a story is just an account of something um, that is meant to have a, a logical sequence. And storytelling is communicating that account hopefully with, uh, with, with some level of artfulness. Uh, communication is of course a bilateral act. Uh, uh, what we say and what is heard uh, are not always the same thing unless uh, the person saying it and the person hearing it are, are on the same page. And, and that's what we wanna talk about here today is getting on the same page with clients um, and how you can go beyond uh, simple data um, to, to actually tell a story that's important not only to you as law firms, but also important to clients uh, as the recipients, and probably even more importantly, ultimately important to the business in which clients are embedded, because ultimately uh, those are the consumers of, of the story. 
um, the values that we talk about ultimately become business value. And uh, one of the most important things law firms can do for law departments is help them tell value stories to their internal stakeholders. There are many different kinds of uh, storytelling uh, and many of them go together, but one of the most powerful is visual storytelling. Um, and so, yes, we can communicate with things with words and many of the times, many of the pictures we may show people are more powerful when they have a voiceover. But the way that we can communicate with visuals uh, has a really important impact on people's perceptions, uh, on people's comprehension, um, and that the story uh, they take with them. Uh, we have at our fingertips a, a massive amount of, of data, um, but that data is not always organized so as to be useful for decision making. That is, it's not always turned into information. And even when it's turned into information, the way that information is presented and communicated does not always resonate with our audience. Um, and that might be because of the story we are trying to tell or because of the stories they tell themselves. Uh, it's absolutely critical that we know our audience, uh, what it is they want, how it is they think, and what it is that they are trying to achieve. Uh, and that always starts with why. Uh, why are we doing this, Bob? Uh, law firms used to uh, just send a bill uh, that said services rendered and had a really big number after it. I believe there's one law firm that still does that. Uh, uh, and then uh, clients like you uh, started asking for an enormous amount of data, both quantitative and qualitative. And so every month and sometimes uh, uh, on even shorter cycles than that, uh, law firms are sending massive amounts of uh, quantitative data uh, with descriptive narrative attached to it. And that somehow that's not enough for you, Bob. You want more. And, and, and I, I wanna know why. You're probably gonna to wanna to go off mute. That always helps. Uh, so yeah, we always want more. And what you were just talking about there, Casey, was all that digital exhaust that comes off of matters that you wanna be able to capture in a cohesive way to tell those stories you were just talking about. And I'm a big Lego fan, so that was really effective for me. I love the fact that they actually have uh, adult Lego sets now that you can actually play with. So that's fantastic. But this quote here, I, I particularly like, right? If, if we have data, fine, let's look at the data. If we have opinions, then let's go with mine. And if all you're left with is just opinions, right? Typically it's going to be the person that outranks in the room making that decision. And it's not gonna be particularly objective. It's gonna be subjective, right? It's gonna be based on someone's experience. And so um, really what you wanna be able to do is, is be able to support your experience and your opinion with objective data. And I think we're gonna get into that and talk a little bit better. Just to give people a little bit of perspective on my opinion, um, I am with Deloitte. I'm a managing director at Deloitte and Legal Business Services. And we uh, provide services to uh, in-house legal departments and help them add you know, greater value to the larger uh, organization. But prior to that, I was at Liberty Mutual for 25 years doing everything from litigation to legal operations. and. You know, you can imagine large PNC companies, Casey, have a little bit of litigation, right? I always used to make that joke that, you know, uh, Liberty Mutual is a company that sued, you know, folks and got sued. And then on the side, we sold insurance, right? So um, to the extent that that was kind of the case, everything that we could do to be more effective and efficient in the delivery of the defense to our insureds or to reduce the overall cost of provision of, of that defense cost, inured to the bottom line. Right. So really what it was about is, can you be good stewards of a company's resource and reputation? Can you tell a story about how you are actively or objectively being a good steward of that company's resources or reputation? For me, you know, I really think it's about helping also to make better decisions faster that lead to better results. If you're not thinking about making, you know, end up with better results on your matters, then what's the point of collecting the information and the data in the first place, right? So um, I think also there was a sense at, at Liberty initially when you, know, you start really overlaying 
significant amount of data, that there was a little bit of a threat response from some of the experienced professionals that you were taking away their, uh, uh, you know, kind of experience or that, you know, the lawyer's opinions weren't being factored in and it was just purely relying on the data. And I would suggest if you go to the next slide that combining data driven practice with experience of individual practitioners is the most powerful thing. So here's just a quick example, staying on your, you know, line of storytelling, Casey, you know, um, there's an interesting story around practicing, you know, advanced chess. So Gary Kasparov, he, you know, you might remember the, his old experience with Deep Blue. And after losing to Deep Blue, he proposed a new game called Advanced Chess. And in that, each of the human players used a computer to explore the potential possibilities of the moves, but they remained in control of who decided ultimately what the next move was. And so bringing together human and computer they found increased the level of play to heights that they had never seen before. It produced less error, right? More tactical and meaningful strategy within the game. And it also demonstrated the process of strong human players and powerful computers and that combination of their forces could be something greater than the whole. And so I don't wanna get lost here that what we're talking about, you know, in this whole thing around how do you measure and metrics and dashboards that you should just paint by numbers, you do still need to have a human element involved in this. And I think that's a really important thing for practitioners to, to remember. So, I mean, that's kind of my experience or perspective on why, you know, do you have an organization that has the right providers? Can you answer that question to your stakeholders internally with competence and be able to support your opinion with objective metrics? So that's where I think the you know, organizations are trying to get to. And it, it's a it's a it's a valid goal. Uh, there's a big question of in this. I'm going to throw to Matt. Is is are they getting there? Uh, like me, you've been both a law department and a law firm, um, moved back and forth, um, and so you've seen you've seen it from uh, both sides, um, and you know that both sides aren't always right, and don't necessarily always know what they're doing. Uh, they may have good intents. Um, everyone is is operating in in good faith, um, but they may not have deep understandings of uh, what it is that they are that that they're trying to achieve or how to achieve it. And so, what are what have you seen that's actually worked, um, and and what is you seen that hasn't, and what is the distinction between the two? Is it the data that's provided? Is it how the data is presented? Um, is, is it how the data ends up being used? Uh, what, 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 what works and, and what doesn't matter? Yep. So in my experience, and, and you're right, I've been, I'm now on the firm side, but I, I came from the client seat um, in the last seven years. I think the biggest, the biggest piece to remember is to have a conversation with the client, right? To ask those questions, because everyone is different. I was in-house at US Bank and at PayPal, and they were both drastically different in terms of preference for information, how they used it, when they needed it, those sorts of things. So there's kind of an underlying component of, to, uh, you know, which we can get to in a bit, but you really wanna be able to meet clients where they're at in their normal workflow, right? Provide the information when they need it, how they need it, and for different stakeholders, right? So the way I kind of think about it is in this matrix, and this is, you know, there are there's nuance to all this and there's certainly other considerations, but essentially kind of balancing friction versus actionable information or considering both, um, you know, in a low friction environment, you are giving the client the right information when they need it. You're giving them the right information, actionable information, things that allow them to make decisions and to help tell that story. So kind of going through the matrix and I won't go point for point here, but you can kind of see in the upper right corner, you know, something that is low friction and highly actionable is something that provides, you know, real time data or near real time has kind of the current status, provides some level of forward looking, right? Part of the story is where we've been, but also where we're going. You know, a lot of what, you know, I, I came from the legal ops seat, right? So I'm a different stakeholder than the general counsel or the attorneys, but a lot of my deliverable was around 
like what numbers can we put in for the next quarter, right? How do we manage the budget? How do we find ways to come in, you know, and provide cost savings and those sorts of things? And then doing it in kind of different layers or having a dynamic delivery system, right? So the most useful systems are the ones where you provide me with a story, right? The synopsis, the 35,000 foot view, provide that human element that Bob was talking about, but also like give me the ability to drill in if I need to and explore and get comfortable with the data. It doesn't make sense to give me the, you know, A through Z every time and every piece of detail because it'll all get washed out and you'll lose the story. But tell me the high level. And if I need to dig in to see something, right, at the matter level to like get down and understand who's working on my matters, whether it's the diversity related question or kind of the drive by, you know, timekeepers, like uh, let me kind of dig into that as needed, make that available. Um, you know, another best practice is like a central resource that is, you know, meets my needs in legal ops, right? Meets the kind of lead attorney's needs, meets the general counsel needs financing, right? Something that kind of takes a kind of holistic approach. And then the right KPIs, right? Like every client's gonna be different in what they care about, right? Some of them care about, you know, the percentage of budget to actual. Some of them care about the total cost. Some of them care about all of it. Um, you know, just kind of having an off the shelf canned report with something that's not going to tell the right story for folks, right? Something that they can't pass off internally um, and help, you know, make themselves uh, meet their own internal goals. The other thing, you know, which was always something I got approached with in the client seat in terms of that friction piece, you know, a lot of, especially large law firms have the ability to create client facing portals, right? On their own website, you go to, you know, you post something on Haiq, but that involves the client going out to that website and pulling down the information and clicking a link and all that kind of stuff. You know, we would have dozens of preferred firms or large firms we'd have relationships with. I don't want a dozen different portals to go through, right? So the ability to like send information into our systems, you know, we collected budget information through legal tracker, like in our flow um, is super helpful. And then, you know, kind of the bottom right part of this matrix, the things that were really the challenges and the things that didn't work were, you know, late information, like a quarterly report, you know, from the prior month or from the prior quarter that summarized everything, like that's old information at this point, like tends not to be very relevant. You know, it's kind of flat, it changes from time to time. So I have to spend 10 minutes every time I open the report to like look and understand what you're talking about this time. Um, and then, you know, the other kind of piece is just like the wrong audience, right? Like the general counsel is gonna want a completely different narrative and conversation and story than somebody in procurement, right? Who's caring about the co unit costs and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. you know, that's a mindful kind of way to think about it. Um, and, you know, in my experience, kind of what makes or breaks um, different matter reporting and storytelling. You know, Matt, I, I want to comment on one thing you said that I thought was really important to emphasize, and I love this slide uh, in the information here, is about the real-time reporting, um, you know, and the difference between getting like that quarterly report by getting something that's actionable. Mm -hmm. I think in an optimal state, you're always looking to be able to intercede in a matter and make a difference during the life cycle of a matter. Um, and uh, to, in order to get that better outcome by kind of looking at the data or being alerted to whether or not that thing is on track or you need to intercede, as opposed to just getting something post, that's helpful. It's good for future learnings. It does help drive maybe behavior into the future, but it does you no good on that matter, right? That actually got right. going forward. So yeah. the closer I think you can get to real time is is important, I think, Matt, right? I don't know. If yeah, you... it's that it's that real time snapshot. And it's also the forward looking piece to anticipate, mm -hmm. like what's going to happen or why things are varying, you know, there's a variation or deviation from what the plan was or the last update. Yeah. The biggest thing like that we hammered, especially on like the litigation side of things in house with our outside counsel firms was like no surprises, right? Like the worst thing you could do, like, we could be a million dollars over budget because some matter, you know, the, the facts of the matter, the way that it played out, it eventually got that, right? Like it eventually kind of went off the rails. But that's one thing to like know that ahead of time and be able to have that conversation as to why those things are. 
it's if you drop a bill on us for a million dollars, you know, in a variance or, you know, that's the sort of stuff that gets people in trouble internally, right? And the kind of, you know, from a cover your own butt situation from the client seat, like, you know, that's the sort of stuff that would drive our litigation folks crazy, right? To, to have that kind of reporting to say, hey, this is what happened, but this is also, you know, kind of how we can change things or how we at least are aware of them before it actually kind of hits and comes through. I totally agree. And not only is that bad form just from, you know, kind of a business standpoint and relationship standpoint, right. there's real life implications like having to do reserving on, right. you know, matters or having to budget, right, within an organization for future litigation needs. So, yeah, I think spot on there, Matt. That's great. Yep. yep. Yeah. And one of the things we talked about in like, I'll, I'll just quickly add it is like on the budget to actual stuff in some of these KPIs. You know, we always want it closest to the pin because if we're reserving more money and then you come in and you think, hey, I was, you know, way under budget. I did a good job. That probably means we deferred hiring for somebody, right? There's real life implications to where that, you know, resources can be utilized. So um, very important to get it right. So uh, Elizabeth, Bob just brought, brought it into the, the, the real world. Um, but but before that, um, he, he said it's, you know, optimal to have have this information in, in real time. And I would actually challenge uh, his use of, the, use of the word optimal uh, and maybe suggest that uh, ideal is more fitting um, because optimal uh, takes into account constraints. Um, and we heard from Matt that uh, off the shelf probably isn't gonna cut it, that different clients need different kinds of reports and not just different clients, different stakeholders within different clients are gonna need different reports. That sounds like a lot of work, um, work done by people. Uh, many of those people are, are, are LPMs. And so how labor intensive does this get from the, from the LPM perspective uh, versus the perceived value uh, from the firm side and at, at least communicated by the clients and how willing are clients to pay for the thing that they are requesting? Um, because they are asking the firm to do additional work. Uh, are they open to paying uh, for additional work? And that and it's it's quite all right if you 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 don't have to challenge Bob addiction because I did it for. <laughs> Well, thanks, Casey. Those are all good questions. Um, I think the answer as to how labor intensive um, reporting can be on the law firm side is that it depends. Um, if the client communicates what KPIs and context are important to their business, uh, a firm can strategize from the beginning about how to streamline delivering the report. Um, if this is not the case, the time investment depends on the nature of the ask by the client and what KPIs are requested. It can be as simple as providing an update on how a single matter is performing against the budget um, at set intervals with a high level summary of activity and can get more complex when clients request a more detailed breakdown of activity across a group or portfolio of matters, which may, <clears throat> excuse me, which may include leverage information, DEI statistics and detailed projections on a go forward basis for costs and fees. Um, reporting that includes an entire portfolio of work across multiple practice areas can also take more time to put together. Um, in general, I think it's helpful to have a few canned reports that can be easily pulled for clients with some basic KPIs. You can pro-offer them as a tool to facilitate communication with the client as to what KPIs they are looking for in future reporting. Um, however, as a lot of us know, a lot of client requests require a, bes a bespoke report which takes more time and can be labor intensive, at least at the beginning, uh, the first time around. Um, as far as what role LPM plays in providing the reporting, um, LPM frequently along with the pricing team in my experience, helps to compile the information and advises on the most digestible format for the client. Um, and LPM is often the storyteller and helps formulate the narrative the report is telling. Um, so with this in mind, uh, I've been in the position where I'm reviewing the information with the client directly or in the alternative, providing a roadmap of talking points to an attorney about the breakdown of the work represented in the report. Um, I think it's key to be able to concisely explain how you are moving the ball forward for the client 
or tell the story, if you will, when you're talking through the KPIs with them. Um, on a more basic level, LPN is often the group responsible for flagging that a report is due to the client for the attorney and taking proactive steps to coordinate putting it together. Um, an LPM can also be a resource to dig in and find answers to any follow-ups the client may have and be in a position to offer suggestions to address any concerns that are raised by the reporting. Um, as an overall theme, I see LPM helping to facilitate putting the reporting together and delivering it to the client at whatever cadence is requested. Um, as far as paying for LPM time when the client is the one asking for the reporting, um, again, I think this depends on the client. Um, clients who are used to seeing charges for LPM time on their bills and recognize the value in those services do not typically raise concerns in my experience. Um, however, if they're not used to seeing those charges, there may be a need uh, for more discussion as to why LPM is a value add uh, to the matter or engagement. Um, I think it's important for LPM narratives to clearly denote what value they are bringing to the matter and illustrate how the LPM's time is helping to move the ball forward for the client on the matter or engagement. Um, and then there are clients who see putting together reporting as a cost of doing business to the firm, which they shouldn't have to pay for. So again, in my opinion, it really depends on the client and whether or not they're used to paying for LPM services. Bob, and I'm gonna give you a chance to, to defend yourself here. Uh, so, all right, it's a it's a cost of doing business, yeah. um, but but clients are are asking for special reports that drive the cost of doing business up. Is 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 that not a cost that 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 should be paid for? And uh, and if so, towards uh, what end? Uh, we have this great uh, matrix here of of better versus worse reporting. Do you actually have some examples? for us of what good reporting looks like. So, uh, yeah, I actually had a question, you know, uh, for Elizabeth on this too, around, um, you know, I think it's interesting, right? I think it's fair, right? If there's expectations set up front around LPN that, that, that people actually are paying for that if it's adding value, right, to the engagement. I mean, I think that should be made clear up front. One of the things, though, that's always perplexed me is how organizations will have KPIs that they're measuring firms by, but they don't actually communicate those <laughs> to the firms. And I'm wondering, you know, either Matt or Elizabeth, on, on your experience from a firm perspective, how often are you having those questions up front about how the organization, the client, is measuring performance so that you can align, right, your service delivery around the things that are most important to the client, because in my experience, it was critical if you wanted to influence behavior uh, from the firms that you thought was important to you or influence behavior on those matters that you communicate how you're, they're being measured up front and then share that back with the firms. I'm just curious about both of your experience around that. Hi, I'm going back to something Matt said earlier um, about no surprises. I think if you engage the client from the onset at the proposal phase, even, you know, what are you looking for? How are you looking to move the ball forward? What metrics are important to you? What's important to your business? Um, you can get everyone on the same page at the beginning. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, uh, I have a few questions like that in an upcoming slide, but I mean, I think one of the big things is like, depending on like, from the, from the firm perspective, a lot of the clients don't know that yet, aren't sophisticated enough, don't have like the mature legal ops programs that probably drive a lot of this stuff. So, you know, there is an opportunity for the proactive firms to kind of offer up those kind of questions, help have a conversation around like, what are the KPIs? What are you looking for? How would you measure us? Because the firms are, would always love that information, at least the ones that are good at it, right? But a lot of the times the clients just aren't there in their kind of journey to build up that program. Yeah, interesting. Well, happy to share, Casey, a couple of examples of internal ways that maybe organizations might measure, right, um, what's going on out there on their matters or by firms. So, you know, here's just a generic example of a law firm dashboard, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. I don't think that this is going to, you know, be earth shattering in any respects, but it's interesting always to kind of just see it visually. 
right? And how people are absorbing this information. This, this particular dashboard is just a snapshot of closed case outcomes. And you know, what the you know, litigation manager might be looking at or portfolio manager for this particular law firm, right? Overseeing a portfolio of matters for a particular law firm would be looking at here is, you know, they could be looking at the median fees per closed case, right? Which gives you a certain view or, or look at this. It might look at the median loss per closed case. And I think that's important, right? If you're only focused on, you know, the fee aspect and you're not looking at the indemnity aspect, you're really missing the boat, right? Because you're willing to spend a little bit more to get better outcomes. It's really about that total outcome, right? What are the, the fees and costs and the actual indemnity on a matter? That's really, I think, how you get to how effective outside counsel can be. Um, so that's in the lower left-hand corner there on the total cost per closed case, right? That's kind of the additional metric there. And then on the right, bottom right section there, you're looking at the days in litigation. And, you know, everybody knows cases typically don't get better with time <laughs> um, and they get more expensive with time. And so you're looking at that's really an effectiveness metric on how efficiently and effectively maybe a firm is driving matters towards closure. That could be extremely important for one particular client. Another client, it might not be as important, right? They're happy to have matters kind of hang out there a little bit. It might even be a strategy to allow, you know, matters to kind of hang out there a little bit. But this is just kind of a, a perspective that I, I would offer that, that, you know, maybe a litigation portfolio manager, maybe even a claims manager, maybe a litigation manager might use, right, to look at a portfolio of a particular firm's cases, right? In contrast to that, the next one, Casey, this is really looking at um, a law firm profile a little bit differently. Um, so this is, you know, here are the things I wanna point out in particular on the right hand, lower right hand side, right? You've still got that median fees per closed case and the median cost per closed case. But in the middle bottom is something that I think is really interesting, which is this is the reduction percentage post appeal. Some people call this errant rate. Um, you know, so any of you uh, law firms out there that are always subject to your bills either being rejected and you have to appeal it or they've been cut for some reason, you know, there are many organizations out there that look very, very carefully at what a firm's errant rate is. And, you know, I would su suggest that many in-house uh, organizations, their goal isn't to cut your bills. Their goal is to get the errant rate to zero. Because if the errant rate is zero, that means that the law firm is performing in a manner that meets the expectations of the client and isn't diverging, right, from the client's expectations and that they're doing work as expected. Um, you know, they're not charging them for things that they shouldn't be charging them for based on, you know, the engagement uh, agreement or letter, right, that you have set up. Or, you know, your panel firms aren't doing something that is inappropriate. You know, they're not charging you for copies or research or whatever it might be right out there. I'm giving obvious examples. But I think the main point I want to make on this about that errant rate is it does you no good to just keep that in a vacuum and track that and not share it back with the firm. And, you know, to your point, Matt, about getting digging deeper and not only looking at the firm level, but maybe looking at the timekeeper level, it may not be that the firm is doing that badly, but there could be a particular biller. Let's say the biller's name was Casey Flaherty, who was billing, you know, in this, you know, Casey's errant rate was 15%. Well, obviously that's an issue that needs to be dealt with with that particular timekeeper that's handling your matters. Uh, so you want to be able to dig down, you want to be able to share that. And if you want to be able to influence the behavior of the firms in a manner that's consistent with your strategy or viewpoint on the way that you want your matters to be handled, you've got to be open and honest and radically transparent about the things that you're tracking and why they're important and sharing this back. So, you know, I go back to the thing I was saying to you, Matt, around real-time reporting, to the extent that you can share this and give it as a feedback loop, you'll get the firm to manage to those expectations internally. So I think that's important. Um, the other thing too, that I wanted to just point out that capturing this type of information and, you know, uh, going down this particular path. The question I would say is, can you learn something from the data on your matters that may inform how you can improve your business? What I mean by that is, can you practice preventative law? So a lot of organizations are really trying to capture this data 
so that they can actually avoid incurring litigation fees or, or you know, getting into disputes in the first place. So if they can learn something as to why they're in them, what's going on, right? What those outcomes were and then how to avoid them in the first place, avoidance is your greatest litigation management tool you know, of all, right? And so if you can practice that preventative law, I think that really goes a long way. Couldn't couldn't agree more on on prevent prevention and and moving upstream um, uh, as a way to it's not just about reducing unit cost it's about reducing demand the the num the number of units uh, I would say that most clients are pretty far from that level of sophistication as much as it pains me to give uh, Bob a compliment um, he's a bit of an he's a bit on of an outlier in terms of the level of sophistication. Uh, Matt, not all clients are there yet, as you just noted uh, previously, um, and need some some help on that journey. And even even if they don't need any help, you often need a conversation, as uh, as Elizabeth alluded to. Um, if you're if you have conversations up front about expectations, uh, you can uh, better conform your reporting uh, to again, the, the stories that people tell themselves and the stories that they need to tell internal stakeholders. And, and so with that, what are some good conversations to have? What are, some, what are some quality questions to ask to understand your audience so you can calibrate your story accordingly? Yeah, um, it is certainly a important conversation to have and one that you know not everyone does i mean it really is one of those things where you know i've been in the client seat and you know somebody will put together this fancy portal and dashboard and everything else without ever asking for it. like whether us not asking for it or them not asking if we want it kind of thing right and they're like well they invested 100 hours in this it looks great but it's not useful to us right and so that that is that you know a kind of a detriment to the relationship so that this this slide is intended to kind of give an overview of some of the kind of questions that I think are useful. This is kind of relevant to everything related to the matter. So, you know, some of these questions tie in to kind of the pricing side, the front end side, but also the ongoing management of it, right? So, you know, one of the questions here on the bottom row is like AFAs, for example, when I mentioned pricing, like a lot of this reporting has to do with hours and effort and all that kind of stuff. You know, part of the fixed fee concept is, you know, it, the predictability kind of takes away the need for some of that reporting, right? So that's kind of a whole conversation too. You know, if we know we're going to bill you, you know, $100,000 every month for this, it's a less of a story, right? I mean, we can tell you what the activity is going on or whatever, but, you know, explaining away and having that narrative for the costs incurred or kind of all the activity, you know, that certainly it diminishes or changes the, the type of you know, reporting necessary. And then you get into all these other questions about like who pays the bills, right? Like if the general counsel pays all the legal bills, that's a different set of reporting and the kind of conversation than if the business line does, right? So if, you know, the litigation is stopping, you know, within the legal department, that's a different report than if something gets, has to get passed through from the attorney to the finance team, to the business line, to all that kind of stuff, right? So you have to be mindful of those sorts of conversations. But you won't really know that unless you have that kind of conversation up front. You know, when do they need it? There's forecasting, you know, some people do it on a quarterly basis, a monthly basis. There's a big annual thing a lot of the times, right? You know, some people need a forecast by the fourth business day of the month. Some of it do, you know, kind of a month end kind of thing looking forward. So there's a whole kind of array that would impact the matter reporting and providing updates and, and adjusting your own internal processes um, to help align with that. And then, you know, there's, so there's a bunch of here and we don't have to go through them all, but like, you know, it gets back into like the feedback loop, right? Like what lessons do we learn? What are the KPIs? Like how do we kind of get, make a better mousetrap each time, right? To say, you know, here is what went sideways last time. We know that because we did the matter reporting, we did the narratives, we did a post-mortem kind of close report. And then that helps inform the conversation for the next time. And it feeds into, you know, pricing and case strategy and all those sorts of things. So it's a, 
it's a broad thing. This isn't certainly an exhaustive list of questions, but it is like the general concept of, hey, there's a lot of people on the other side of the client relationship, not just the lead attorney or the business line folks. That data can go kind of all over the place, get synthesized. You know, a lot of the times they're pulling a headline number or something like that and plug it in into a spreadsheet. Is that accurate, right? Like you're going to tell them like on a quarterly basis, like, you know, they're going to plug in a hundred grand every month or every quarter. Like, is that accurate? Um, if you tell them it's a, you know, going to be 1.2 million for the year kind of thing, like, you know, and having all those sorts of conversations so that you know, kind of, and have control because once you lose control of that data and that narrative, then you're kind of at risk for, you know, kind of all the things to go haywire um, for sure as the matter progresses. Well, so Elizabeth, things things can go haywire and uh, matter reporting has uh, an important role to play in ensuring that they don't. Assuming it's it's done well, that we answer these questions the right way and understand what those answers mean um, uh, for the purposes of reporting. Uh, can you give us some takeaways? Uh, and just for the audience, we're about to open it up to, to Q&As after Elizabeth gives us these takeaways on uh, how matter level reporting ultimately benefits the client, how it ultimately benefits the firm, and maybe most importantly, how it benefits the relationship between the client and the firm. Absolutely. So if matter reporting is done right, I think, and tells a story as it should, um, meeting, meeting the client's ask, uh, the client has an accurate picture of the matter or engagement in a digestible format, it is able to report out the KPIs they need to their general counsel or other business units, which I think provides peace of mind because they have an accurate picture of how their dollars are being used by the firms they do business with. Um, additionally, the client can see trends in work and spend to inform future activity. Um, if reporting is done right, it also provides the client with the ability to share their priorities with the firms they do business with in a practical way and move those forward if they don't think they're being met. Um, it gives the client insight into how well a firm manages matters and provides an opportunity for feedback. So again, a lot about communication and opening those channels and making sure they're fluid. Um, the benefits to the firm, um, I think providing clients reporting that helps them meet their obligations makes the firm easier to do business with and can lead to client retention and I think overall makes the firm look good. Um, reporting is also a chance to showcase efforts in matter management, pricing, and innovation um, when you're walking a client through the narrative that the KPIs create. Uh, trends are identified, the firm can work to increase efficiencies on matters and streamline service delivery for the client. Um, detailed reporting, which includes phase and task information, offers clear insight for pricing future matters as well. Um, reporting holds everybody accountable for the activity on the matter, and again, opens lines of communication with the client. I think as far as the benefits to the relationship between the two, um, good reporting can make the relationship between client and firm more transparent and can provide both sides again, with a chance to communicate with each other in a meaningful way um, based on data. Um, because I think we're all trying to move toward making more data-driven decisions. Um, it can illustrate how the needs of the stakeholders are being met or not being met um, and can ultimately enhance, enhance collaboration um, through deeper, wider relationships with legal operations professionals, GCs, and other stakeholders with the client and the firm, at the client and the firm. Wonderful. Can I say one real quick thing about what Elizabeth just said that I think is really important around the transparency, communication, and deepening relationships? So often I hear, you know, in my role now that clients are worried that if they start making these requests or that they start creating, you know, uh, these sets of metrics or they start measuring the firms in this way or demanding the firms do this in a certain way, that it's actually going to harm the existing relationship that they have. And quite honestly, it's exactly, in my experience, the opposite, that it actually typically enhances the relationship. It actually makes the firm more relaxed about how they're being measured, and it takes away the guesswork, right? It puts everything out on the table. There's no questions. 
And so I would just say to folks out there that are nervous or concerned about kind of going down this path and saying, oh, well, I've been working with these forums for so long. I don't want them to be upset. I, I like the fact that they're so committed to my work. Believe me, this will have the opposite effect in my experience. This will deepen the relationship, not harm it. And I hear that a lot. I don't know if that's something that you and Matt, Elizabeth, hear on this or not, but that's pretty significant. I think I like that it provides, I like what you said, and I like that it provides everybody the opportunity to get on the same page, um, because I think ultimately firms want to provide good service to their clients, and this is another aspect of that. So if we know what the ask is, it's easier for us to meet it. Yeah, yeah. and it's a, it's a competitive advantage, right, or a disadvantage, depending if you can do it or not, because if you don't do it, somebody else is. And right. being able to provide that service and that value add, you know, that you put your practice at risk otherwise. Yeah, I agree. Isn't it more fair for me for the as an in-house person, let's just say I'll take on that persona to tell you how you're being measured and alert you to the fact that I'm going to be diverting work to firms that perform better on these KPIs and diverting work away from firms that do worse on those KPIs. Why would I want to hide that ball? Why wouldn't I want to be out there in the open and say, look, um, I'm actually comparing like firms in the same jurisdiction around like matters. Here are the things I'm measuring. You should know this is how this is how you're being measured. This is the scorecard. And I'm going to share that back with you on a periodic basis so that you can manage to that. It's a very makes the playing field much more fair, much more open. And, you know, it's certainly going to get me as an in-house person better results because they know that they're competing against others and against those measures. They know the rules of the game that I've set for, for ourselves. So I think that's kind of a crucial aspect of it. But um, you know, I think we covered a lot of that. So I think that's great stuff. Elizabeth. And spe speaking of open, questions are open, and we, we'd invite them from the audience. Uh, uh, we're on time. We we have 13, 13 minutes left to to, to answer them. Uh, uh, while while you get while you get those in, I know I've uh, played devil's advocate in part just because I enjoy it. Uh, but uh, uh, I've been on both sides, uh, and. Uh, on one of those sides, the firm sides, I've seen um, pretty compelling data um, that matter level reporting both increases realizations by a substantial percentage and client satisfaction scores by a client percentage. And there's there's a bunch of mechanisms uh, at play here. Uh, one is that to get matter reporting right, you do need to have those upfront conversations. And it, frankly, that's just an ex extension of scoping. There's not just scoping the matter from what needs to be done, there's scoping the matter in terms of understanding what the client's expectations are. And there's a certain discipline that goes into deciding how the, the matter will be measured and, and doing so together. Um, that, that discipline uh, then brings with it a certain level of rigor on the, the firm side. Uh, you need to be able to get things into the reports properly uh, and you create an accountability internally uh, that you didn't have necessarily previously or as a standard matter of course. Um, then speaking of courses, by, by uh, communicating the, the reporting, you have the opportunity for course correction, uh, especially early on, uh, whether it's you're going over budget or uh, coming in under budget or things aren't going uh, to plan because you got the matter, the, the phase wrong or something, there is, uh, you get to course correct early as opposed to late, especially way late, uh, which is when bills really start getting chopped. Uh, and finally, uh, those realization numbers and the client satisfaction scores go up, even with, and this is something we can track sometimes, the client never actually looks at the report. Uh, it makes a big difference that they can and that they know that they can. And that actually changes the story of the relationship. Having that level of transparency um, heightens trust um, and also shifts responsibility uh, from you should have told me of, oh, I should have paid attention. And so even when clients don't look at the matter level reporting, it can have an impact. Uh, the, one, the one word of warning I, sh I would give is that it can become very labor intensive um, and therefore it should be proportionate uh, to the size of the matter, the, the juice has to be worth the squeeze. Um, of course, in Bob's world, the action is the juice, uh, but uh, it's, it's got it's got to be worth it and that there, there should be 
matters where we're off the shelf uh, reporting should be sufficient. Um, smaller matters, uh, routine matters. And, and frankly, there's often a large, large swath of matters where the only thing in-house counsel cares about is, is it on track? Um, cause they can be because they can be tracking a huge number of matters, but they can only pay attention to a few of them. And they need to know, is this something I need to pay attention to? And if the answer is no, they're not gonna be looking at a detailed report. And so the most important thing you can do isn't provide detailed reporting, it's to give them that heads up um, that this is something for them to pay, them to pay attention to. Uh, even with me monologuing like a Bond villain, per, as I usually do, I still don't see any questions. Uh, happy to give people some time back uh, or uh, close out with some comments from any of my co-panelists. Yeah, so I, I have a couple of just comments here, you know, if another question comes in or just to kind of close out. I, I would go back to, uh, I love the questions, you know, that you put up, Matt, you know, just as a threshold, right? Um, and I would say if you're not, if you're collecting things that don't allow you to make better decisions faster that lead to better results, you should question on why right, uh, you're collecting those things, right? Because is the friction of collecting it worth, right, the actual outcome that you're getting? Or, or are you making decisions based on that, right? I think that's really a, a big question. Is the information you're collecting actionable, right? Um, and then the other part that we didn't really discuss on, and this might be part of another webinar, um, but it does go to kind of the story to be told here. Um, collecting this information and working collaboratively with your law firms on this may lead to the conclusion that the job that is being done, the outcome that you were seeking can be done with either out the assistance of an in-house lawyer or without the assistance of a law firm or there might be an alternative way to source or get that done. There might be a way to combine alternative sourcing with your law firms to get better outcomes, but you may not know that unless you're actually doing the things we talked about today and measuring them in an objective way so that when you go to make those decisions, it's not just based on gut or your opinion, right? So that the you know, person who's most senior in the room is making the decision, but that you're making a decision collaboratively based on both experience as well as the objective data. Excellent, still no questions. Matt, Elizabeth, anyone uh, want to take us home or shall we give people a few minutes back? I think I've said my piece. I think I have too. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, again, uh, first of all, thank you to the panelists. You were all uh, excellent, uh, really enjoyed it, very insightful. Uh, and, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to LVN for having us. Uh, uh, had a great time, great panel. Um, and everyone have a, a wonderful rest of their week um, and have happy and safe holidays. Thank you. Thank you.